in your program. You have the detailed bios of each of the three speakers, so I'll just mention very, very briefly each of the three speakers. The first speaker will start, and the next one I'll call up, and the next one, but I'll say a word about their bios to start with. So Nadia Axe here is the Senior Research Associate here at the SickKids Center for Global Child Health and at the Dalana School of uh, Public Health, University of Toronto. And she will speak on using health metrics for analysis and decision making in low and middle income countries. The second speaker I'd like to welcome is Dr. James Blanchard, who's a professor of community health science at the University of Manitoba and a Canadian Canada Research Chair in Epidemiology and Global Public Health. And he will speak on Leave No One Behind, Implications for Global Health Programs and Research. And finally, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Pamela Collins, who's a professor of global health at the University of Washington, and she will speak on mental health and sustainable development challenges for the year 2030. Each of the speakers will have an opportunity to speak, and then I'll call up um, our two main speakers to the panel, and we'll have an opportunity for a, hopefully at least a half hour to ask all the questions that we couldn't ask before the coffee break. So uh, with that, uh, Nadia, may I invite you to the podium? Uh, well, thank you very much, Stan, for the lovely introduction, and thank you, everybody here, for um, coming to um, the session and also having me here to, to share some of my reflections with you. Um, and thanks to the Gardner Foundation and the University of Toronto and Sick Kids for inviting me, um, for feeling that I'm uh, on the level of some of our esteemed <laughs> awardees and participants to share my thoughts with you. Um, I don't think I fit that profile, but I will try my best uh, to, to share some of my work, and uh, hopefully you find it interesting. So I guess to, um, to go somewhat in line with the theme for the symposium today, um, I, I wanted to pull together some slides on how we in our work at the Sick Kids Center for Global Child Health, particularly in um, Dr. Zulfa Karbuta's portfolio where I work, um, have used health metrics in, in different ways. So some of the existing health metrics that are out there, which some, some of which were shared earlier this morning, and then also other ones that we've tried to kind of pioneer and create ourselves um, to really drive impact and decision making at the local level in the geographies where we work. So let me get started, just a brief agenda. Um, I'm gonna start with defining health metrics and I, I felt that this was important. I think several of us know what a health metric is, but I think it's good to, to have a foundation for the rest of uh, the presentation. What is it exactly I mean when I'm talking about health metrics? Um, some of the known limitations with data availability in low and middle income countries. So all, for all of us here who work in global health, this is nothing new to us. Um, but I just wanted to highlight some of the challenges with data and then later on in the session through looking at examples of Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, I wanted to highlight how we've tried to overcome some of those limitations or to manage those limitations in various innovative ways. And then finally, I'll close with a summary slide. Okay, so what is a health metric? I tried to do a bit of a search to find out uh, a really good concrete definition of health metric. And it turns out that a lot of people use the term health, health metric, um, but a, a definition was hard to track down. Um, and I think it's somewhat intuitive to everybody, we know what a health metric is, but I wanted to get that by the book definition. And I, I found, I think, a pretty good one by Marie and Frank from 2008, which essentially says that a health metric is the science of measurement and a specific set of instruments and indicators that provide the empirical basis to understand a particular object of inquiry and action in our context, health or global health. Um, and some of the examples were shared in the earlier talk, the ones that we're really familiar with, mortality indicators, for example, cause of death, disease incidence prevalence, DALIs, HALIs, some of the new um, innovative ways that GBD has tried to operationalize health uh, and measuring health. Um, I think those are all really good examples of health metrics. So keeping that in mind, let me um, move on to what are the data sources and the type of information that's typically required to generate some of these health metrics, particularly for that, those of us who work in global health. So we work in contexts that are low and middle income, low resource, sometimes conflict ridden, um, experimenting, experimenting environmental uh, calamity sometimes. So data is difficult to track, uh, to measure, and, and quality is often an issue. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the data limitations that we often encounter working in global health. 
They're, they're typically incomplete or low quality civil registration vital statistics, and this is you know, measurements of births and deaths and, um, and counts, et cetera. So that makes it extremely challenging to estimate mortality with a level of confidence or fertility for that matter. Uh, these contexts often have weak surveillance or health management information systems, so they may exist, may not exist. The data may be of questionable quality, um, so that's a, it's another kind of challenge that we have when we're trying to look at how certain interventions are delivered in the areas where they're supposed to be delivered um, and whether or not, or not that's happening. So measuring process outcomes, I think, is challenging with those type of weak systems. Uh, census data is sometimes available, uh, typically about 10 years or so spaced apart, so um, useful but not uh, that helpful for, for having more frequent monitoring of health outcomes. And so what happens is we, we rely a lot on large-scale surveys. Demographic and health surveys, multiple indicator cluster surveys are just two of the examples that I've listed out there, but we also um, work, and I'll, I'll show you an example of this, but with other not, uh, large nutritional surveys, for example, or reproductive health surveys that are conducted in the country by various different agencies uh, and the government. However, these surveys also have their faults. Um, so sometimes the quality is questionable, particularly in those geographies or regions of a country that are hard to reach or are insecure. For example, Afghanistan, which I'll show you an example of. Some important variables are not collected, um, which is a problem when we were trying to do to map out a pathway of change for some outcome of interest and the variables that we need are not in the data sets. Um, and sometimes if they are collected, they're, they're really low quality. And one example I'll give of that is um, looking at uh, birth weight, birth weight of a baby in DHS surveys, which I do a lot of work on in nutrition for another project. Um, and that's it, the DHS survey collects that data, but it's based on maternal recall. So there are several issues with the quality of that information. So looking at quality indicators, um, and, and missing information, I think, in surveys uh, somewhat hampers the utility of the data sets that are available to us. M missingness in the available variables is always an issue. Um, and often these surveys um, don't have the type of disaggregated information that we need for local level planning. So the survey may be designed to be nationally representative or some larger region in the country, but rarely do we make policies um, so we can we can set, a, set national agendas or policies, but to really um, set um, programming and, and efforts at the local level where they have impact, we need that granular information, and that's typically not available in surveys. So, um, but we have what we have. <laughs> so that's my quote there. We have what we have, uh, and the show must go on. We have to figure out how we can work with these data sets because, of course, uh, we need to make decisions. Investments will be made in countries. Um, and so what is the best way to move forward? And I, I just wanted to share with you, I think, some of the reflections from my work in my short five years that I worked in global health. So it's not a long time. But I am a statistician and epidemiologist by training, so I've, I've worked quite a bit with the data, thinking about conceptually and pathways to change, the type of variables that are available, missing this. All these things are uh, factors that I kind of live and breathe every single day. So um, what have I encountered so far in our work, and how have we tried to overcome those challenges is what I want to share with you. So a few broad reflections, but maybe I won't go into these. I'll show them through the examples of the work. So the first example here is on Afghanistan, which is a country that I do a lot of work on. And the bigger question that we were trying to answer with a case study that we published on Afghanistan was, despite the donor investments and rapid development that's happened in Afghanistan since 2002, has there been any impact on health and survival? So those are really broad question. Um, and some of the challenges in answering that question, the context is unstable, mortality data is questionable of the few surveys that have actually attempted to collect child mortality or maternal mortality information. Um, several regions, particularly conflict-prone regions in the south, are inaccessible, so or have been inaccessible in different surveys, so that's a challenge when we're trying to estimate mortality for those areas, or even health uh, service coverage. And also a CRVS system is virtually non-existent in the country. So how do we answer this question when we have all these data limitations? And I think this is uh, a good example of where the, the first reflection that I wanted to share, um, our approach was working with the existing data, triangulating information as much as we could across diverse sources, and talking to experts in, in country on the ground who have the exp experience and expertise, um, even at the local level, to try to understand 
uh, the deficiencies in the data, the inconsistencies in the data, and, and come to some general consensus on what we think might have happened. So a, a broader version of this work was published in the Lancet Global Health in 2016 as part of the maternal and child health case study on Afghanistan. So here we looked at how uh, maternal and child mortality has improved over time, whether or not that's been linked to improvements in healthcare service utilization, um, improvements in population nutrition, and also looking at some equity analyses and health systems and financing changes. So a bigger case study, but I wanted to highlight a few data examples for you. And what, what us as a, a research team working with this data, um, what we had to, some of the difficult decisions that we had to make. So here's an example of model child mortality. mortality. So as I mentioned, Afghanistan has few child mortality surveys, um, variety of different uh, limitations have been published on those surveys, implausible fertility ratios, et cetera. And so we rely a lot on the modeled estimates, the global modeled estimates. And, and what I've contrasted here, this is uh, a figure from the paper, um, which our reviewer also asked us to do, was to contrast the two leading agencies who are deriving these modeled estimates and to see how they compare um, and, and to think more about whether or not we believe the estimates that are coming out of this data. So up at the top, I have under five mortality, which we can see um, the blue line is the UN estimates and the green is the IHME, the Global Burden of Disease estimates that we were able to get at that time. So I think that goes up to 2015. Um, so looking at the two lines, they, they more or less track together, which is good and positive news for us. It looks like under five mortality probably improved uh, or reduced in Afghanistan, and there's some level of, you know, some discrepancy, but I think within a confidence band, a level of uncertainty. So we're comfortable with that. Um, so that was good. Looking at the newborn mortality underneath, uh, the IHME, sorry, the UN estimates are in red, and the IHME estimates are right underneath. So again, really close. Some difference in the, the intercept or the starting point of mortality in the year 2000, um, but more or less tracking with the same trajectory. So more of a discrepancy, but I think we as a country team were, felt good and confident that, okay, child mortality probably improved and so did newborn mortality. Um, so we could think more about what, what might, might have driven that change. So then we looked at the maternal mortality, which, um, here we have the UN estimates in red and the IHME estimates in green. So this was a bit more challenging because if we looked at the UN estimates, it looks like maternal mortality had gone down from 1,100 per 100,000 live births to about 400. So dramatic improvement. Uh, the country was raving that they had reached their MDG5 goal and this is such an accomplishment. Um, however, when we contrast with the GBD estimates, it told a very different story. Um, it looked like actually maternal mortality had gone up um, and still alarmingly high. So at that time when we were trying to publish the case study, it was tricky for us to, to tell a coherent story of what happened to maternal mortality. And I mean, we can have a longer discussion about the data sets that went into maternal mortality and, and they're even more limited uh, compared to child mortality in Afghanistan, but um, this was what we were dealing with. So one of the lessons that I think came from that work um, for me was that despite advanced modeling methods that are used uh, by leading agencies in the world who have a lot of expertise and experience in doing these things, the estimates are only as good as the data. And so, for example, for child mortality, pretty good estimates, comparable estimates, maternal mortality where the data was more spurious, we could see really clear inconsistencies in very similar methodologies that these two groups were applying, um, leading to very different results. And so, the importance of data triangulation and expert consultations became very apparent to me. That the data is one thing, but looking at other, the mortality data is one thing, but looking at other information, for example, how did the rate, the prevalence of skill birth attendance, for example, increase over, increase over time, or did it not increase, um, or antenatal care coverage, or other interventions that are related to maternal health, did those things improve over time? How did other factors in the country that are typically associated with maternal health change over time? And trying to understand those trajectories by correlating with, relating or triangulating with other useful information. And also consulting experts in the countries. The experts know what's going, what is going on generally. So talking to people in country, in the ministry, at the local level, uh, about how they feel their communities have changed, how the policies have been implemented. Um, I think that was a really valuable part of that exercise for us. 
Um, finally, uh, just to end on this point, I think, just to caveat all this, because I think somebody will ask me, how did you reconcile the differences? The decision making and agenda setting in countries will happen. Um, whether or not we have good data, because people need to know what their priorities are, they're gonna make investments, they're gonna um, uh, implement some interventions, so that will happen. Um, so I think it's, as researchers and those of us generating the data, it's really important for us to make plausible inferences based on the information that's available and pooling together all types of information to make those inferences. And for example, the mortality stats that I showed, uh, I'm not comfortable to say that I think child mortality is X number. I think it could be X number or ranging in and around that, in that area with some confidence limits and then talking more about the trajectory. So I think being careful about the type of inferences we make and being honest about the type of information that is leading into those uh, data or modeled estimates, I think is really important. And um, this is an example in Afghanistan anyway, where health metrics have dri driven decision making. So just a final point to say that uh, based on our case study results and some of the data that I've shown you and others that I'm not showing you today in the interest of time, there was a maternal and child health call to action in May 2015, uh, where we talked about the findings and talked about what are the priorities um, based on the results that we've pulled together. Um, and now the country is revising their basic package and essential package of health services based on some of these data as well. So health metrics to, to drive decision making will happen and it's good to be able to provide the scientific evidence that, or the best scientific evidence that we can to help be part of that process. So the second example that I'm going to talk about is also about Afghanistan. And here the question was looking at the nutritional status of children and women in Afghanistan. Um, from the case study work, what we found was that nutritional status had improved in the country, both for women and for children. Um, however, just given the, the nature of uh, interventions for um, improving nutritional health, it was difficult to, to figure out where to prioritize the country's efforts. And they were really interested in knowing which regions lag behind or which districts lag behind and where, and because Afghanistan is so complex in terms of geography and climate and environment and insecurity, I think those granular information were really important for them to make the right decisions and the right investments in the areas where it was needed. Unfortunately, the only large-scale national nutrition survey that ha the country had, which is this 2013 survey, didn't really provide regional data. Um, and so we were put in a position to figure out how could we use the data that's available to us to drive or to calculate some more granular estimates. Um, are there innovative ways that we can do this? And, and so we, we tried, um, and this is the second reflection that I wanted to share. Uh, applying rigorous statistical methods to counter missing data and to derive granular estimates in different contexts. So this was published as part of our um, Afghanistan nutritional geospatial analyses in the Lancet Global Health in 2018. And, and what we did was we used the National Nutrition Survey of Afghanistan 2013, and we looked at a variety of different metrics, uh, child stunting, wasting, and underweight using anthropometry data, and also maternal um, underweight and short stature. The sample size was pretty good, um, pretty large. So about 16,000 mothers had valid anthropometry data and 22,000 children. So certainly not small sample sizes and all 34 provinces of the country were covered. Not all districts, but all provinces had pretty good coverage. Um, when we consulted with experts, they generally felt that the anthropometry was pretty good quality and that the coverage of the, this particular survey in the country in terms of insecure or hard to reach areas, uh, areas was, was decent to work with, which is not the case with several other surveys that I've analyzed in Afghanistan. So given that, we felt confident that this is probably a really good data set that lends itself to some further rigorous modeling. And we employed some Bayesian geospatial models. Um, where we generated for the district, and there are 30, 399 districts in Afghanistan. We generated estimates for all those outcomes that you saw um, at the district level. And of course, there are areas, as you saw in the talk this morning, where there are missing information, districts have missing information or spurious data. Um, and so the way this modeling works is to use the available district, other available district information, and also to draw on information from neighboring districts to try to generate the most plausible estimate of that particular outcome. Um, and some of the covariates or these priors that the model draws on include province level factors, urbanization, uh, household economic status, food security, and female illiteracy. So only some of the, the variables that we were able to 
drawn um, in terms of making these uh, predicted estimates of prevalence. So here is a slide where I've shown you a map um, of the child outcomes, so stunting, underweight, wasting, and then the co-occurrence between stunting and wasting across the country. I'm just going to blow up one of them so you can see it a bit clear, uh, more clearly. This is stunting, um, and the, the dark lines represent the provinces. So the province lines in the country, and remember there are 34 provinces, um, and actually the survey was designed for province level estimates, so that was not an issue. Um, but what's interesting is if you look inside the province, there's quite a bit of heterogeneity, even within a province, um, sometimes ranging from 20 to 30, 10 to 20% prevalence of stunting to upwards of 60% within the same district. And this is not really surprising to us. This is actually, in fact, one of the motivations behind doing this analysis to begin with, because we knew that those that type of heterogeneity existed. Um, so. Yeah, just wanted to show you the, the type of information, I mean, granular information we were able to generate from this model. And we did the same thing for a variety of maternal outcomes. And here is underweight for mothers between the ages of 15 and 49 years. Again, much lower prevalence on average across the country, um, but certainly heterogeneity that we see even in, in you know, in, in many different provinces. And I think provinces such as if, I can't point apparently, but if you look at Cabo, um, and in this example, even within Kabul, which is one of the most accessible and has the richest data, it's the capital of the country, um, even that province has pretty significant heterogeneity. So, if, you know, one of the critiques from the reviewers of the paper was that um, maybe you just have spurious data, but actually even in that province where there was really good data, there, we still see heterogeneity in, in the estimates. Um, so really interesting stuff. Uh, and I think the lesson that I've learned from this is that Modeling good quality data, not bad quality. Uh, good quality data to overcome data sparseness is possible and powerful, and I think that we've seen some of that with the, the GBD efforts as well. Again, data triangulation and expert consultations cannot be replaced. They're critically important. Even with these geospatial estimates that we derived, we would not have published them without the, the buy-in or the, the, the validation from country experts who could speak to certain contexts in the country and talk about whether those estimates made sense to them. So I think that that's always something that should be a critical part of the process when uh, before we're ready to make, you know, um, or put a stake in the ground about certain inferences from our data. I'm not gonna talk about the data set and modeling limitations, but those are out there and there are many typical limitations of analyzing DHS or these types of national complex surveys. Um, and then finally, I think this is another example of where health me metrics have driven decision-making in countries. So in Afghanistan, the nutrition stakeholders who we worked with have shown keen interest in this data since we've published it, and in fact, they're even using it to make some local level uh, plans for nutritional interventions in certain communities, and also to do additional data collection and research in areas where we've identified really high burden of overweight and obesity, for example, or malnutrition. Um, so additional work is, is, is happening with this data. And they've also used some of this information to set their upcoming priorities in their nutrition agenda. Okay, one minute, okay. So, <laughs> I'll try to make this good. The last example that I wanna share with you is from Pakistan. Um, and this is about the Lady Health Worker Program. So I don't, I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with that program, but it's a, a similar, I guess, to the commu a community health work type of community-based platform program. Um, it's been in place in Pakistan since 1994. There are about 92,000 or approximately 100,000 uh, lady health, health workers currently active in Pakistan. And one of the questions that government and people who are funding these programs actively want to know is what has the impact been on health and survival? Um, and the program has been going on for so long and has changed faces and expanded, et cetera. Uh, but it's actually really difficult to answer this question. Um, and, and currently in the literature in Pakistan, there are very few analyses that have tried to look at LHW impact other than in some small areas. Um, but to look at a, a broader kind of population level impact, it's been quite challenging. And so um, I think some of the challenges there are that the data on LHW coverage is uh, available, but usually not related to functionality. And why that's important is because the government might um, designate an area as covered by the program, but doesn't necessarily mean all the LHWs are functioning to their max capacity or doing everything that they need to be doing in those areas. So functionality is a problem, um, and actually functionality is not measured. 
and, and the type of data need, required to measure functionality does not exist. So we um, approach this in this last way that I've mentioned there by conducting targeted surveys to collect the type of information that we would need to measure functionality. Um, so if it's not currently collected, let's see if we can build that into the surveys that we are conducting, and then innovating in the measurement and analyses of uh, different metrics uh, to help us be able to measure functionality. So this work is not yet published. This is preliminary analyses from um, uh, the bigger Umidha Now study that's happening in Pakistan at the moment. Um, but we essentially looked at the effect of LHW functionality in the country on a variety of different uh, child mortality outcomes. And I wanted to share with you two examples of, of outcomes today. The data source was a customized household survey that we did in eight districts, which again asked some of those questions around um, whether or not LHW came, et cetera, so to, to, uh, to understand from a mother's perspective um, and experience whether or not how she was encountering or experiencing the LHWs. Um, the metrics we looked at were child mortality outcomes, and then three different ways of classifying LHW, which I'll go into uh, a minute, but uh, um, the LHW coverage as defined by the government, and then also from some of our own ways of defining functionality. The sample size was about 32,000 mothers, so pretty good data to work with. The statistical method that we used, we derived a composite metric of LHW functionality from individual um, activity questions. There were about 16 questions that we asked mothers in communities. We used principal component analyses to derive the latent constructs or factors that might proc approximate uh, functionality. And then for analyses, we did three types of sensitivity analyses. We created a simple additive score using the PCA factors. We also created, uh, sorry, of the, uh, using the individual questions from the survey. It's a really simple way of approaching functionality. We created a PCA score from the, the, the method that I just mentioned, and then also looked at the LHW coverage as what was defined by the government. So I wanna show you the child data. Now, this is the data on relative risks, so the risk of death um, in children, uh, according to LHW covered and uncovered areas. So the reference is non-covered areas, the, the exposure or the group underneath is the covered areas. And then we have a series of modeling exercises. So we have crude uh, shown first and then model one, two, three, four, all the way up until model five, which is the fully adjusted model. And you can see the covariates that were adjusted for down at the bottom. But this was essentially to do sequential adjustments across a pathway of change uh, or things that might have impacted the LHW functionality. And what we can see actually is that according to the non-covered areas, the LHW covered areas seem to have some protective impact uh, effect on child mortality. And that's consistent. We see some attenuation of the effect as we do sequential adjustments, but, um, sorry, not even attenuation actually, various directions, but um, the, the effect is, remains pretty strong that it's protective. Now, if we separate that group of coverage into functionality, and remember we said the areas might be covered, but the area, the, the, the LHWs are not necessarily functional or doing their job properly. This is what uh, the data looks like. And now here I've shown you the, the results based on the composite score from the PCA. The additive score showed very similar trends, so I'm not gonna show those ones, but we organized or separated the group of um, covered into minimal, minimally functional, moderately, and high functionality. And just to show you, if you look at the crude results, there is some evidence, so there is protection, again, with child mortality, protective effect, and there is some evidence of a dose response effect. So increase in functionality of health, lady health workers actually has a more protective effect. Um, and that's consistently the case in every adjusted model that we did. So this is great news for the program um, and also makes a lot of sense. Just really quickly, there is the data on newborn mortality. So, I don't know, LHWs are killing babies, apparently, but they're doing very good in terms of taking care of uh, children after the, the newborn period. So really strange, um, when we disaggregate further into the functionality groups, the same type of trend we see. So a bit of a paradox, um, interesting point of discussion. We also looked at other outcomes, stillbirths, perinatal, et cetera, just to find out where is it exactly that the LHW program seems to reverse direction at what point um, in, in a child's lifespan. And so I, won't, I don't have time to, time to show that data today, but uh, yeah, very similar kind of findings that we see. So just to wrap up, 
Uh, lessons and limitations from this exercise if feasible, conduct targeted surveys, which is what we found. Uh, if the questions don't exist, find a way to collect those questions. Um, innovation in deriving new metrics, particularly composites, is possible, powerful, and useful. Um, and again, data triangulation and expert consultations, which is the next step with these results, is also important um, to discuss uncertainties in the inferences. Um, direction of causality, cross-sectional surveys, so all the limitations that comes with that. I, I won't spend too, too much more time on that. And then um, I think this is a really good example of showing where decision-making drove innovation in health metrics. So this is what, where the country was interested in their program and they wanted to make decisions about the program, but they didn't have the data to support that. So we were tasked with saying, hey, okay, let's see if we can figure out how to drive the, derive those metrics um, and help you make those decisions. Um, yeah, summary and takeaways. The use of metrics to measure health and drive decision making is a critical part of global health. Data limitations are inevitable as we've seen and there's a long way to go before data capture systems exist in these contexts. Um, innovation in designing metrics, design and analysis methods are critically important. Um, however, we should be cautious when we're making inferences and make sure that we're triangulating and get ex getting expert opinion on interpreting some of the data. And most importantly, let's do our best and have fun. So uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Uh, Zlotkin and, and everybody for, the, uh, for arranging this, for inviting me to the Gairdner Foundation. It's really a privilege and an honor to be part, uh, part of this uh, symposium today. Um, and uh, really already had a tremendous amount of stimulation from the, from the talks that preceded. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, th this agenda that we're hearing more and more about. Um, I, now if you're in hallways of, of global health policymakers, you're starting to hear a lot of discussion around, around leave no one behind. I wasn't really sure what that meant. I don't spend that much time uh, in those contexts, but um, you do hear this as a, as a, as a, 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 a a constant conversation around the SDGs. And you can see that this agenda, the leaving no one behind agenda, is an explicit policy priority under the um, SDG agenda. And you can see it here, it, it, it makes its way for two pages in the goals report of 2016. Um, and I would say that if you read the, if you read those two pages, it's kind of still at a very aspirational stage um, in the sense of, uh, there's a sense that equality needs to be built into the SDGs um, and there's um, an expectation that that becomes part of how we measure progress is, is whether we're doing a good job of, uh, of, of uh, making sure that nobody's left behind. Um, there have been some attempts to try to develop some policy formulation. I'm sure there's many more than this. This is one that I found uh, quite useful from Stuart and Semin from the Overseas Development Institute. And what they did is they sort of uh, thought about it in the sense of, at the one level, it's reducing inequalities. At the very basic level, leaving no one behind is about um, reducing inequalities, which is quite tractable, uh, certainly from a measurement perspective. Um, and they talked about reducing inequalities between individuals, the idea of a vertical, vertical inequalities, or what they described as vertical, or between groups of individuals, whether they're defined um, um, as, as belonging to a definable um, group by socioeconomic position or geography. Um, they talk about fast-tracking actions for the poorest and most vulnerable, uh, uh, this idea of progressive universalism. Um, and then they even go on to talk about it or articulate the fact that um, different countries might take different approaches to this um, agenda for reducing inequalities. Countries that already ha that have very high levels of deprivation, the challenge might be just m raising all um, or as many as possible to a minimum living standards. Um, whereas countries with less deprivation overall, the focus might be on closing equality gaps. So this is one way of thinking about uh, the policy formulation, but a, a, still a long way between that and, and actually um, implementing policy and developing programs. Now there's a very long and rich history uh, of developing, uh, through using an empirical lens to describe what's happened with, in, with inequality. Um, it, this is an example from Brazil which showed dramatic increases um, in overall progress, but particularly um, substantial reductions in inequality across a range of, of, um, of indicators. Uh, and in this case, uh, both um, 
uh, reductions in inequality across geographies and across socioeconomic position. Um, so you see this, um, now uh, there's notable areas um, where, the, where there hasn't been the same levels of, um, of progress, but you can see that generally this empirical approach to describe how inequalities have have reduced over time, um, there's a lot of different methodologies and ways and data sources for looking at this. The issue though is that, that most of the time what happens is we describe empirically what's happened, um, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how do we achieve that and how do we accelerate that. So there's been analysis of how did, and, and there's a lot of hypotheses about why these changes have occurred, but giving more specific guidance for policy or for program um, design uh, is a bigger challenge. And there's a lot of, there's a few strategic questions uh, when we're thinking about policy and planning to reduce inequalities. Um, so for example, should, should we think about for a given condition or for given types of interventions, should we think about targeted or population-based approaches? Targeted meaning identifying those who are uh, the most deprived or who have the, the, uh, the, the lowest, um, um, uh, um, quality of outcomes um, and targeting uh, programs for them? Or should we look more at population-based initiatives, try to raise the whole, um, the quality of everyone? Um, and then if we're thinking about targeting, should we think about targeting by socioeconomic position or targeting by geography? So these are very important types of questions that health programs will have to grapple with if they're thinking about an agenda that's explicitly trying to uh, reduce inequalities as a, as a priority. There's also um, challenges around thinking through whether the emphasis should be on vertical or horizontal or, or, or so-called diagonal programs. In other words, what is the scope of interventions and what would be the best way of, of achieving um, um, greater equality of, of, of outcomes? Should we be focusing in on particular interventions that are um, high, highly effective um, that could make quick changes? Or should we focus on delivery platforms or health system interventions that are, that are likely to, to, to have an impact across a range of outcomes? These are important questions in terms of policy and, and investments. And they're not always um, satisfactorily <laughs> available for policymakers. Um, the, the, um, th there's been quite a bit of thinking around the implications or the consequences of choices. So this is work that uh, Froelich and Potvin have, have done um, where, they, where they critique the idea of a population-based approach uh, where you're trying to sort of move the overall population in, in, a, in, a, um, in a positive direction in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the averages suggesting that when you do this, you often increase inequalities, the, the so-called inequality uh, paradox, with the idea that what happens when you, when you put a, a broad-based or population-based intervention in place, what happens is that the, the concentration of benefits goes to those who are already um, uh, having better outcomes, and the concentration of risks remains with those who are already at risk. And so the, what, they've, what they advocate for is that in, in many cases there should be a very focused and targeted um, set of activities for those who are most vulnerable or most at risk. Um, now, there's been some pushback to that construct. Uh, so McLaren and colleagues have, have pushed back and said that, well, it really depends on how you define a population-based strategy. Um, so they think more about population strategies as being either superficial or radical. So you could have a, a so-called population approach, which is fairly superficial, like public health information or health promotion campaigns, which may, of course, um, result in these inequalities in terms of outcomes, or you could have radical interventions, or the so-called radical interventions, where they're structural in such a way that, that everybody would benefit from them, like clean indoor air uh, laws. And if you think about these, and, and the way they describe them, is that there's a spectrum between what they call agentic uh, interventions, or those interventions that require agency, or in, they, they rely on an individual's capacity to choose and act. Um, so those obviously are, are going to, um, um, they're going to be more susceptible to challenges with population-based strategies, whereas structural interventions where you're changing the quality of institutions or you're changing social norms around beha behavior that shape individual actions, they may actually be um, uh, reduced inequalities. So the idea here is not so much whether it's targeted versus population-based, but actually the selection of the types of strategies that you use. 
Now I'm going to shift into sort of an example of how some of these challenges in reducing inequalities might um, manifest themselves in an actual program. So this is a very uh, large program. It's work that we're doing in, uh, with the MNCH program in Uttar Pradesh. For those of you who don't know India or Uttar Pradesh, it has a population of 210 million. It would make it about the fifth largest country by population in the world, 78% rural. It's a, it's a massive challenge for, uh, uh, for a health system or, or, um, or a program with 75 districts, over 105,000 villages, um, and a very big and complex um, sprawling health system with um, 600 community health centers and more than 20,000 sub-centers and more than 150,000 uh, community health workers at the front line. Five million births annually um, with uh, relatively poor performance, um, certainly for for India and globally with an MMR of uh, over 200 and an IMR of over 40. Um, and it, it accounts for around 9% of global infant deaths every year. So it's a very big, sprawling, complicated um, program. And the, the idea here, or the project, was to support the government uh, to improve MNCH outcomes. Uh, and the idea was to, to focus on interventions, proven interventions, in the antenatal period, the labor, around labor and delivery in the postnatal period, that would improve effective coverage of those interventions. So the, I, the, the drive here was to achieve effective coverage of proven interventions that would thereby uh, improve MNCH outcomes. And implicit within the, the challenge was to reduce inequalities uh, because of the stark inequalities across um, the, uh, the population in UP. Now, if we think about effective coverage and deconstructed, I pulled up a bit of an old construct, but I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's still a very helpful way of thinking about things. If we think about the effective coverage of health interventions, it really boils down to the availability of, of interventions, the utilization of, uh, of those interventions, and their quality. And so um, a lot of the investments and the decisions that we make in, in, in programs are really around, are, are trying to drive towards effective coverage through the, through the process of incre increasing availability, utilization, and finally, quality. And if you think about this, you have both structural interventions, like the improving the availability and accessibility of services, uh, making wider availability of, um, of delivery points or antenatal services, you also have a number of uh, interventions that are really around improving, uh, that are more agentic. They're improving the utilization of available services. So services there, how do you mobilize and, uh, and increase the utilization of those services? And then, of course, at the top, you, you're improving the quality of those services because people using a poor quality service won't get the health benefit. Um, the, the, most of this um, sort of coverage um, operation curve really focuses on getting to contact coverage, and I'm going to talk mostly about contact coverage. So the idea of how do you get people to services and, and using services that, where they could potentially receive effective, um, uh, high-quality services. So this is, um, this is the situation in UP um, in the 100 focus blocks that, that we started with, um, which had a population of about 31 million people um, in 2014. So you can see across the 100 blocks, very, very low coverage of antenatal care. So this is at least one antenatal visit um, uh, during pregnancy. Um, and across the 100 blocks, you found uh, under 50% of, of women overall had any an antenatal care, um, but huge variety between blocks. Um, so across these 100 blocks, each block would have an average of 2 to 3 million population, uh, uh, sorry, not, um, not 2 to 3 million population. They'd have three, 400,000 population. Um, across these blocks, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have this huge variation. Similarly, institutional delivery was highly variable across the block. So we saw substantial geographic heterogeneity block by block. Um, and, and obviously, there was huge opportunities for improving the overall performance if we could bring the lower performing blocks up to the same status as the higher performing blocks. And we also found substantial inequalities by socioeconomic position. So this geographic heterogeneity was reflected by, by heterogeneity and socioeconomic position. And what we found was that the geographic heterogeneity was 
higher in those of lower socioeconomic status. So the, the, the geography and the, there, was a, there was an intersection between the geography and socioeconomic position, which is not surprising. Um, so encountering this, the idea of how to increase contact coverage, essentially we were not very strategic. We, we sort of threw in some uh, agentic interventions or interventions to improve the use of available services and we also tried to improve the, the availability and accessibility of services. So for institutional delivery, we worked with the government to make specific investments on filling in gaps uh, where there weren't um, delivery sites by activating and strengthening institutional delivery sites. Um, and then a major initiative that the government undertook um, that we supported was to integrate ANC services into their monthly village health and nutrition days, which historically had just been routine immunization um, days. Um, but there was a capacity and there was a policy framework that allowed them to, to also deliver antenatal care. So, to, so building on the VHND platform ANC services was a major initiative and this was done um, within 12 months or across the whole state by the government. Um, the second component was really the idea of if the, if the service is there, how do we improve the utilization? And this was done through a very large initiative to try to improve the effectiveness of these hundreds of thousands of outreach um, um, frontline workers and through other community interventions. And there was a major initiative on training, mentoring and job aids. Um, and so we sort of did both. We, did, we weren't really sure what was causing this disparity. We weren't sure what was going to drive increasing contact coverage. So we, we worked on both availability and on trying to drive uh, utilization at the same time. And what we found was we found really, if this is for antenatal care, this is at least one antenatal visit. And you can see between 2014-15, which is at the baseline, and 2017, which is the, which is the third round of, of um, of assessment, there were substantial increases, both for literate and illiterate women. So, um, so this shows, the, the box and whisker plot shows the, the, the uh, variation between blocks um, and the overall mean. So the, among women who are illiterate, it went from around 34% to over 85% had at least one antenatal visit. So dramatic increases for both illiterate and um, literate women. And you can see some closing of the um, disparity by block. So that if you look at the index of disparity, there were dramatic reductions both for literate and illiterate women. Um, so um, really substantial changes in any ANC. And I haven't showed it here, but if you look at any um, ANC in the first trimester or four ANC or ANC in the final trimester, all of those indicators have, have showed dramatic in, in, in improvement as well. Um, similarly, there was, uh, but, but not, as, uh, not as acutely, there were substantial increases in institution delivery. So this shows for both literate and illiterate, not as much change, not as much uh, improvement by socioeconomic position or by, by geography in terms of the disparities, but still substantial improvements in, um, in institution delivery. Um, so we were trying to understand to some degree how this had happened because we had sort of thrown a bunch of things together. We hadn't done it in an experimental or quasi-experimental way. We had just tried to strengthen um, the, the, what we thought were the constituents of, of, of contact coverage. Um, but then the question became, um, what were the patterns that we were seeing in terms of the, uh, in terms of the improvement, particularly at the level of, of operation of the, of the frontline workers? So this is a little bit of a, com a complex slide, but um, this is the joint distribution of the percentage of ASHA areas, that's the area covered by one frontline worker, where you have no women receiving any ANC services within a block. So as you go to the right, you have blocks with higher and higher proportion of their ASHA areas where none of the women are getting any ANC. Um, and as you go to the left, you start to get more blocks with, that have a higher and higher percentage where, um, where um, the, um, uh, or you get fewer and fewer of the ash, uh, blocks with fewer and fewer of the ash areas that have no women receiving ANSI. As you go up the, the Y axis, um, you're increasing the proportion of ASHA areas where all of the women are getting an antenatal care, an antenatal, um, care visit. So you have, uh, in essence, you're, this, is, this is where you're starting to increase your utilization to 100%. So what we, the way we've sort of conceptualized this 
is as you move from the right to the left here, you're reducing disparities in the availability and accessibility because you're getting fewer and fewer places where nobody's getting any antenatal care. So in a way, this is um, strengthening that, um, the accessibility. But as you, move, as you move up, you start to see um, disparities in utilization. So even though most of the ASHA areas have, uh, have at least one or, or uh, some women going for antenatal care, um, you have big disparity in terms of the, the blocks, in terms of the percentage of ASHA areas where all of the women are, are going for antenatal care. So there's, there's um, uh, utilization gaps. And this is another way of framing it. Uh, if you look at the ch changes in the distribution of ASHA areas based on 100% versus 0% ANC contact coverage, by literacy, you can see that at the baseline, um, roughly 38% among, among literate women, about 30% or 38% of um, ASHA areas had 100% contact coverage and uh, you know, 34% had 0% uh, contact coverage. And by, the, by, by three years later, you could see that for literate women, there, were, um, there was almost 90% of the ASHA areas overall had, um, had um, 100% contact coverage, and very few of the ASHA areas had no um, coverage. Uh, but you can see here still, uh, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the difference between the illiterate and literate, we feel that this is probably the remaining challenge in terms of driving utilization among um, illiterate women, because uh, you, you, you still have a lot of um, ASHA areas where you don't have 100% uh, contact coverage. Um, there, uh, th this is just an illustration that one of the things we're trying to move towards now is understanding variations in the quality of services. So you can get to contact coverage, but if you're not able to understand whether that coverage is effective coverage, uh, we're going to need to find ways of, 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 of measuring this better. This shows you that it's, um, it can be very heterogeneous at the local level, often because a single person uh, will will de will determine what what the quality of service is for that whole area. So the auxiliary nurse midwife who does the ANC clinic, if she's not measuring anybody's hemoglobin, then nobody gets measured. So it becomes very punctuated by the quality of uh, healthcare providers, and you can see the different blocks have different patterns of distribution of quality. We're also trying to come up with methods for measuring clinical skills and practices in facilities so that we can understand what proportion of the population is not just accessing uh, services, but whether they're accessing high quality services. So you can see over time, there's been a progression. The blue are the older, um, um, the, 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 the facilities that got the earliest um, quality improvement mechanisms, and the gray ones are the latest um, ones for intervention. And the, the size of the bubble is the delivery load. So trying to look at um, the progressive improvement in the quality of delivery um, skills and practices, um, in, in this case in community health centers. So trying to pair in an understanding of the, of the quality of services so we can get a, a sense of the effective coverage. Um, so I think there's a number of future research challenges, something, to, something that I've been thinking about. Um, how can we better diagnose the causes of inequality and plan to reduce them? So the idea of not waiting for them to happen, but actually planning for it. Um, how can we uh, better um, and more efficiently integrate data on coverage inequalities and causes across a continuum of care? So we're, we're generally able to do this for things like ANC or institution delivery or postnatal care, but looking at showing that continuum across uh, the continuum of care and how that's happening um, is, is, a, is, is more difficult. Um, what are some feasible and useful ways for measuring variations in service quality? I think we, we're, we're going to have to tackle that at, at, at some stage. Um, and one of the things that, that I've noticed over the last 10 years is this explosion of the development of routine health information systems. With the availability of smartphones and tablets, everybody's collecting data and all of the data is going to some, um, uh, to, to some uh, computer storage system somewhere. But the question is, what data do we need? Um, how will we use the data that, that, that we're collecting? And how can we use those data to track progress towards reducing inequalities? And I'm gonna stop there and thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to be able to celebrate, oops, um, 
celebrate this occasion with uh, Drs. Murray and Lopez. I'm going to talk to you um, about the kind of current state of mental health in the global context, but I'm specifically going to highlight pieces of the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and Sustainable Development, which was just published two weeks ago, um, which is really all about how mental health is relevant to the sustainable development goals. So anyone who's working in global mental health and has been working in the field for some time wears at least two hats. Um, and one of those hats is always a, an advocacy hat because it's always about how do we harness our collective energy in order to ensure that decision makers recognize the importance of these uh, disorders for population health and well-being. And this has meant several things. I, I like this particular model that Schiffman and Smith lay out. It's, it's, been, it's about working to have a cohesive community, strong actor power, a, co a cohesive community of, of leaders, of civil society, of institutions that can effectively mobilize to advocate. It's been about seizing policy windows. So those political moments in global health when conditions align favorably with an opportunity to present information to decision makers. The sustainable development goals are one such policy window for uh, mental health. It's also meant learning how to portray the issue in ways that resonate with external audiences. So the ideas that we generate are very important and those ideas are often based in the research that's conducted. And I think important to a conversation today is that it's incredibly important that we have credible indicators, that we have clear measures that show the severity of the problem, that we can size up the burden of disease relative to other problems, that we can talk about mortality and that we have effective interventions and can communicate well the extent to which the proposed means of addressing the problem can be clearly explained, can be cost effective, is backed by scientific evidence, and is simple to implement and inexpensive, all of those magical things. <laughs> um, but that's what, that's what evidence, uh, that's what we often hope that public health evidence will give us. By the time I entered the field of global mental health as a psychiatric resident, we had this key piece of evidence from the Global Burden of Disease study. We had the credible indicators that actually raised the profile of mental health in global health, that these were a set of disorders that were disabling and who's, um, and, and not just disabling, but that actually having these disorders also put you at risk for discrimination and other uh, unpleasant health outcomes over the course of life. So the last 25 years, um, as you can see from this array of publications and um, kind of landmark events, has been marked by a growing frequency of these policy windows, these special opportunities for global mental health. And the most recent one, as I mentioned before, I, I would say are the 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, which the inclusion of mental health into these goals has been a result of many years of advocacy and many years of, of research. And over the last three years, the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health, a group of 28 commissioners, of which I'm one, has worked to reframe global mental health within this broader paradigm of sustainable development. And the challenges to meeting mental health needs are large, and in some cases, worsening. This, actually, this is a, a newspaper article that's reflecting a recent study from the Global Burden of Disease data showing that suicide is a leading killer in many parts of the world, but this is focusing on India, where it's a leading cause of death among married women, but not just among married women, among young people in India. In the United States, our headlines have been full of the bad news about the opiate epidemic, that in fact, it's responsible for a growing number of deaths due to overdoses. And we know that the burden of disease attributable to mental disorders is large and growing. We learned this morning that in fact, that's mostly due to population shifts, but the end result is that this burden has increased by nearly 50% in the past 25 years, and that these disorders now account for one in every 10 years of lost health globally. 
And when we examine these things together, these are disabling disorders of youth. I think you can see that um, this is age on the x-axis. So from the ages of 10 to 35, let's say, when people are entering school, finishing school, beginning, beginning families, moving into the workplace, the impact of mental disorders is quite strong which makes it somewhat different from other non-communicable disorders. And again, later in life, you can see here that, the, the, uh, that dementia is on the rise, and that's where we see another set of impacts. But interestingly, dementia, neither dementia nor suicide are actually included amongst the global burden associated with mental disorders. So the estimates that we have um, are probably underestimates. These disorders are not only disabling, but they are also responsible for a considerable number of excess deaths. And these are deaths mostly due to non-communicable diseases, in some cases to HIV. People with severe mental disorders are two to three times at higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease, two to six times higher risk of death due to respiratory diseases, two to three times more likely to die from accidental deaths, two to four times more likely to die from infectious diseases, and two to four times more likely to die due to homicide or violence. And in fact, when you look globally, if you are living with a serious mental illness, um, your lifespan is shortened by anywhere from 10 to 20 years. So this is not only a public health issue, I think it's a considerable human rights issue, why we haven't been able to address this kind of disparity. Equally important are that our mental health is, is intimately connected to the social environment, the social political and, and environmental contexts that we live and breathe in. One in three women and girls experience violence in their lifetime. Two billion people in 35 countries and territories are affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. 36 million people live with HIV. Around one billion urban dwellers live in informal sediment, settlements. All of these can be linked to social determinants of mental health or mental ill health. The cost of these disorders is quite high as well. About 50 million years of work could be lost due to anxiety and depression. That's a really big number. Um, but mental health conditions can also cost the global economy substantially. There's an estimated $16.1 trillion in uh, loss outcome by 2031. And finally, these are disorders that, um, that, are, that can be humiliating, that lead to a loss of humanity. Tens of thousands of people around the world are chained in their homes or detained in facilities where their human rights are disregarded as a result of having an illness. So there are clear reasons to invest in global mental health, but why is this not a global priority? And how do we know it's not a priority? We have data, um, but something clearly is missing. So the reasons are certainly to promote human rights and reduce exclusion, to reduce human suffering, to prevent premature deaths, to reduce economic costs, and to reduce poverty and social disadvantage. But when we look at the years of life lived with a disability in low-income countries, lower-middle-income countries, upper-middle and high-income countries, and then we look at the percentage of total health spending on mental health, you can see that the spending is not nearly commensurate with the need. And in fact, the numbers get a bit worse when you look at development assistance for mental health. So that's HIV, um, which at the top, maternal and neonatal health, malaria. And the, the blank spaces here are actually that. They're really blank spaces, <laughs> that the scale is so vastly different that they, the, the, the spending doesn't actually even show up on this, on this graph. Um, the net effect of this is that we have poor care everywhere. In high-income countries, and I'm gonna just, uh, actually I'll go back one just so that I'll, I can accentuate this. So in, in, in low-income countries, fewer than, the percentage of people that are actually getting minimally adequate care ranges from one to 4%. But the news is, is that it's not that much better in high-income countries. So when we talk about 
people that are getting minimally effective treatment for depression, anxiety, or substance use disorder in a high-income country, you're still talking about for something as common as depression, less than one in four, fewer than one in four people. For substance use disorders, only one in 10 people. And for anxiety disorders, maybe 14% of people are getting that kind of care. So this was the reason for the Lancet Commission to figure out how do we begin to reframe the way that we think about mental health and mental disorders? And I'm going to talk briefly about three main shifts that are guiding that reframing. One is acknowledging that mental health exists on a spectrum, ranging from day-to-day -day wellness to long-term disabling conditions. So this is meant using a dimensional approach to our diagnoses. Um, this makes sense when you think about how can one apply, uh, you know, how can these be relevant to the sustainable development goals? Because we have to think not just about categorical illnesses, are you ill or well, but what is that dimension from being asymptomatic to having some distress to moving towards um, a defined disorder and finally to treatment resistance where you have very different needs in terms of rehabilitation and in terms of the role of a public health system. So the dimensional approach recognizes this continuum that really reflects our daily experiences, and it allows also a more balanced focus on mental health promotion, on prevention, as well as on treatment and rehabilitation. The other important uh, reframing is to think about a convergent approach which requires taking advantage of knowledge from diverse disciplines, recognizing the social determinants of mental health as well as the bio biological determinants of health and applying these in a life course perspective. So this means recognizing that genes play a role, that environment plays a role, that there are critical periods in development where it's best to intervene when we think about prevention and health promotion, and that there, of course, are times when rehabilitation is going to be one of the key ways of intervening. Um, again, recognizing that when we think about those sensitive periods, childhood and adolescence are key moments in the lifelong shaping of our mental health. And the third reframing is around human rights, that mental health is a fundamental human right, that people living with mental ill health should also be at the center of planning services and challenging the stigma and helping to set the agenda. So guided by these principles, the commission outlines a blueprint for action that includes seven primary recommendations. So first, mental health should be reframed using the sustainable development goals framework. If you take a look, this is actually showing some of the main sustainable development goals but also linking these to determinants, social determinants of mental health, both distal factors that include community diversity, gender equality, income inequality, infrastructure, deprivation in neighborhoods, the built environment, natural disasters, war and conflict, climate change, forced migration, um, community social capital, to the more proximal factors of age, ethnicity, sex, financial strain, employment, safety and security, trauma and violence, and individual social capital, um, education and social support. But these very nicely link to very specific um, SDGs. The second is that mental health care should be an essential component of universal health coverage. And why is that? We have interventions that are suitable across the life course. I think of in the last decade, there's been a tremendous growth in the evidence for psychosocial interventions delivered by non-specialist providers so that in low resource settings and high resource settings, one can utilize local human resources to deliver these evidence-informed interventions. We can now use digital tools for the workforce, for the health system, and for the affected person. We have models of care that can address the full spectrum of problems and that can also address the needs for service delivery in low, medium, and high resource settings. 
And community engagement is, of course, important here in order to increase the demand for care and accountability for good care. And finally, in 2007, the Lancet series, the very first Lancet series on global mental health, launched a call for action to scale up mental health services, particularly in in developing countries. I think with this commission, we would say that's still equally as important to scale up services. But we're changing the frame from simply low and middle income countries to low resource settings, because some of those are within high income countries, and those places equally need to increase access to their populations for mental health services. The third is to use public policies to protect mental health. Again, here there's an opportunity for action on social determinants of health to alleviate poverty, to promote nutrition, to educate everyone, to enhance equity, to advocate for gender equality, and to oppose violence. And of course, these are, you know, one of the important, um, one of the important issues of, or, or aspects of this broader framing is that these are issues that many people <laughs> are interested in and that we can sign on to together in order to try and meet the sustainable development goals, but also improve our population mental health. The fourth is to strengthen public awareness and the engagement of people with mental disorders. This means implementing evidence-based interventions to reduce stigma and discrimination, to engage civil society in meaningful ways to involve young people and people with lived experience in all activities, including policy making, service planning and research. It means we need to make more and better investments in mental health. This includes increasing national financing. Right now, uh, there's a much, much less than 5% of health budgets in low and middle income countries is devoted to mental health. That was actually a goal for the WHO Mental Health Action Plan from 2013 to 2020, we've not reached that goal. Still, on average, around the world, about $2.50 per capita per year is spent on, on mental health. But the resources need to be used more efficiently and effectively. They need to be uh, moved away from large institutional settings, hospitals, there's been a push for that for many years, into the development of community-based care. And we need more developmental assistance spent on mental health. There's been a tremendous uh, investment in research, relatively speaking, in global mental health over the last many years, but very little investment in actual implementation. And at the same time, we do need to reinvigorate research, both discovery science and delivery science. The discovery science to ensure that we are actually getting at the causes and mechanisms that enable us to make better treatments and better interventions, and the delivery science so that we can make sure that even the things that we know work now can get to the people in need. The grand challenges in global mental health, which uh, many of my colleagues in Toronto were part of, um, still stand and still need solutions. So we need to understand the early stages in the development of mental disorders. We need to develop new preventive interventions. We need early detection and improved diagnosis. We need to better apply transdiagnostic interventions. That means uh, the kinds of interventions that can treat more than one problem at one time, especially in places where you don't have a highly skilled workforce. We have to scale up the training of care by less trained providers. The lady health workers were a great example of applying um, actually training people to deliver an evidence-based uh, mental health intervention in Pakistan with great success, and programs like that show that this can be done. We need to sh know how to use technology effectively, when and where to use it in the context of mental health care, and how best to enhance demand for services so that people that need care uh, can get care, and that the systems can then be responsive to those needs. And finally, we need to strengthen monitoring and accountability. There have to be good metrics for ensuring that countries are actually meeting these targets. We're doing that with some of the sustainable development goals, but when we think about the array of relevance uh, for mental health with the sustainable development goals, there, are there, there is quite a larger set of indicators that could be put to use in this case. So in summary, the reframing is to reframe mental health as a global public good a universal human right. 
an indivisible part of health. We can't start, we can't keep talking about our mental health and physical health. Um, it's important to all people in all countries. There's a particular relevance to youth. And this is a crucial contributor to human capital. This is, in fact, one of the ways in which the World Bank is now talking about the importance of mental health and its programming, that this is critical to uh, building human capital. So we've moved from no health without mental health to no development without mental health. And I want to just acknowledge um, the commissioners who, and the many people that helped to put this work together. And thank you for the chance to share. So, you know, one of the interesting developments uh, with Dr. Tedros at WHO is um, a reformulation of how to measure the uh, universal health coverage. And I think that touches on uh, the last two presentations uh, quite a bit. So there's been quite a lot of discussion and, and a new proposal on what indicators to include in the official SDG monitoring of UHC. And it goes back to this, um, you know, sort of Don Obedian's notion of structure, process, and outcome. And I think the, sh the, the shift is towards uh, more measures, more indicators that are outcome-based, uh, that, that are healthcare sensitive, but there's more of an outcome that's driving it. So take the antenatal care one, lots of debate two, two three weeks ago at WHO about how sure are we that one visit matters at all, or even four visits without the quality components? And so I thought there was an interesting theme there on across the, both the mental health and the, and the UP uh, discussion about how we make UHC measurement uh, reflect the totality of care that we actually care about. And the link to the GBD is that, uh, you know, WHO and, and um, is, would like to use and will use the GBD database more to get those outcome-based measures as part of what goes into UHC measurement. Thanks, Hannah. It's nice to be on the asking uh, rather than the receiving end for a change. Um, but I have two questions, one for Pamela, one for Nadia. Uh, Pamela, you, one of your um, principles towards the very end, you talked about research on mental health, and I think we all strongly commit to that. But I w I'd like to push you a little further on that because it seems that we that in a, in a space where the research has not advanced as far as it has, I think, in things like cardiovascular disease and cancers, we'll need to prioritise that. And so would you, would you think, if we were to prioritise, that the research should be around applying what we know works better? In other words, how are health systems, how can health systems improve the delivery of established interventions or increase knowledge about what we don't know? Uh, and there seems to be, there's, there's an awful lot that we don't know about interventions for mental health. So be interested in your, in your comments on that contrast. Uh, and secondly, to Nadia, uh, very early on you made a statement about uh, we have what we have in data. And, and I think that's true to some extent. But one of the, the principles I, I mentioned this morning on the global burden of disease, we, we were faced with exactly the same thing, is we try to extract truth from the data by a systematic and detailed uh, approach to data quality, because we know all data are wrong. So how do we fix it? And I didn't get a sense from your presentation, uh, which was very good about principles of triangulation and so on, but you didn't really delve very much into fixing data quality. Uh, and that may well account for some of these contrasting trends. So just some observations from those presentations. Sure. Thank you. That's a that's a great question, and certainly a question that, <laughs> that that we've been asking for a long time. And and having having worked as a funder for some time, that's always a balance that people are struggling with. Um, I think in this field, I, I think there's an urgency to to do what we do know works, and to figure out how best to implement what we know works. Um, the numbers in terms of death, the disparities and longevity. We need to deal with those those issues because those are those are population health problems. So we definitely need to implement what we know works. But I don't think that's an either or. You know, if you look at the way funding is now, there's a lot more funding going to the how do we understand mechanisms and how do we begin to uh, figure out the best ways of identifying new targets. So that still needs to happen. But I would say that we need a, a somewhat increased portion of that pie focusing on the implementation science. So, 
Hello. Hi. You guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, I think I, I just quickly jotted down three notes on data quality. Um, I think that that is a really important point and something that we continue to struggle with, uh, particularly in the context where I do a lot of work, Afghanistan and Pakistan, where for a variety of different reasons, data is sometimes of questionable quality. So there are a couple of different ways that, um, and I didn't go too, too much into this, but a couple of different ways that I think we've tried to look at data quality and, um, again, vet uh, whether or not we feel comfortable with moving forward with analyzing the data. I think the one is looking for internal consistency um, within the data set by looking at other measures of, for example, anthropometry or some other variables that typically should be correlated together um, and trying to understand if, if a certain variable of interest to us is, is um, maybe good quality or is it questionable. So so linking within the, the survey itself and, and looking at consistency. And that, again, that's done through a variety of different um, statistical ways and also consulting with our experts who are familiar with the data. Um, I think fixing data, um, missingness or quality through imputation, um, again, through looking within the data set and figuring out if it makes sense to uh, remove observations that don't make sense um, and impute certain values using a variety of different techniques. Um, we've also considered that and played around with those options. Of course, there are several issues when you, when you think about imputing information. Um, so the, there are some of those options that we've considered as well. And then prospectively, um, working with the, the people who collect these surveys, either the UNICEF team or, or others, um, and also some of our own surveys in Pakistan, working with them to make sure that we overcome some of the uh, data quality issues that we know exist. And then whether that's with the way the question is asked, whether that's with interview fatigue or the interview is not trained properly, um, or making sure that there's a third party mechanism to, to request some certain variables or measuring. So I think prospectively incorporating those quality checks. Um, we've tried to, to do that as much as we can. If you have in front of you a light that is not blinking, it is your turn to ask a question. When you've asked the question and the answer has been turned it off and the next person whose light is not blinking will be the next questioner. There's a light that's not blinking up there. Uh, thank you very much for nice presentations. Uh, uh, my question is about the methodology of uh, uh, the, uh, the getting the value of between 0 to 10 scale. That is the basis of many metrices in GBT. So late Professor Gavin Mooney has uh, uh, quite a, who was a health economist, has reservations about uh, who to ask and how to ask. So how the GBT is uh, addressing that. This is my question. Thank you very much. Uh, so the, the GBD has gone through an evolution there. In the first cycle of uh, GBD, when it was a very uh, underfunded, small effort, uh, we used panels of health experts to come up with the health state weights. Uh, and then as the GBD got, uh, both, both there was a sort of vigorous academic debate about uh, whose values you want to use or whose judgments of, of uh, health severity. What we shifted to in, since GBD 2010, is population-based surveys of individuals from the general population. And what they're asked is pairwise comparison of, of health states with a lay description of the health state and asked to say which pair of, uh, is, represents a higher state of health. Uh, and those pairwise comparisons across um, cultures turn out to lead to highly preserved scales. So the correlation from, let's say, rural Tanzania to the US is about 0.95 in terms of uh, the uh, severity that comes from that. That's very different than uh, asking people about the total welfare associated with the health state, which has been what health economists like to do. And in our view, asking people for those very integrative welfare judgments is really quite problematic because there's lots of other things that go into people's total state of, of well-being that are not related to health. Um, and what we have found is that by focusing on health, which is what the GBD is about, we get these, um, we don't find any variation, for example, by education, we don't find any variation by income, and we don't find any variation across country where it's being measured. So it's the general public's view of severity. 
This is a question at the back of the room. Yes, thanks. Um, I'm Dr. Alex Barron. I'm one of the pediatricians here at SickKids, and uh, I'm also a consultant to BORN, the Better Outcome Registry Network of Ontario. Um, I spent from 2009 to 2011 in Afghanistan and Kandahar province, um, particularly dealing with immunization and infrastructure could, programs. Could you speak up a bit? I was saying I, I spent from 2009 to 2011 in Afghanistan working um, with infrastructure programs for immunization and maternal uh, health care in the conflict zone. And I'm heading down to uh, Ecuador next month to work with the indigenous Shuar people of the rainforest who have never been studied. There, is, there are no data on, on those individuals. My, and my question is for Dr. Axir, because I found particularly that when I was in Afghanistan, there was a tremendous number of um, mothers who had um, morbidity and mortality issues related to rheumatic heart disease that had never been reported before, and the D22 strain in particular. And we found that because all we had to do is place our stethoscope on their chest, and you could hear that, um, that valve abnormality. And the local people didn't know that, and the local interveners didn't know that. So I wanted to get your sense because I thought you said something really interesting. You really do need to get the local perspective. You need to get those people on the ground who have talked to the people um, in those villages to get a sense of what's really going on. I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit more about what interventions you would um, hope uh, could take place to allow that um, better uh, implementation of local um, applications of, of services. Sure. <laughs> okay, so your question was at the end about what interventions I would hope uh, could take place at the local level to allow, what was the last part of the question? We get people on the ground in those villages to actually make the assessments rather than making large assessments which may be wildly wrong. Yeah, and Can I defer this question to my boss? <laughs> well done, Nadia. <laughs> I was going to ask a question. No, the question is very important. How do you get community ownership of data? And that was actually one of the questions I was going to pose to Jamie and, and Chris and Alan in response to district health information system. Maybe you and I can have a conversation on rheumatic heart disease in Afghanistan on the side. There's a lot of stuff that's emerging from what we are doing with the FMIC in Kabul around the unrecognized burden of rheumatic heart disease and also congenital heart disease early on in some of these geographies that just does not appear in DHS surveys or in you know any kind of uh, mixed surveys or estimates that you have. So there is this so-called NCDI, the non-communicable diseases which are neglected in the bottom billion, uh, which do not appear from any of these uh, district estimates. But they may appear in district health information systems, DHIS or HMIS. Now the problem is, let's take the example of Uttar Pradesh, Jamie, where you know more than others. When the regular information systems are bad, people have a knee-jerk reaction to ignore those when you do disease burden estimates and just go to surveys. And, and there are others, and I agree with Alan uh, in saying, if you've got bad data, there are ways to fix it. And if you don't attempt to fix that, both in terms of the source and quality of the data, you will forever have this dichotomy of deriving all your estimates from surveys as opposed to routine information system, including SRS or sample registration or surveillance data. So my question is, how do we ensure and make certain that we are looking at the right data. I'll give you one very specific example from Afghanistan. Now you have these counterintuitive findings from surveys. Nadia just presented the, the lack of, or the really the opposite relationship to neonatal mortality in the Lady Health Workers Program coverage in Pakistan. When you dive down, one of the potential reasons for that is that your sampling frame does not include uncovered areas. So you're principally artificially getting an estimate of higher mortality risk because you're looking at not the entire population. Now in Afghanistan, we noticed that as part of the natural nutrition survey that we did there. You got some estimates from conflict-affected districts which were totally counterintuitive. And the reason was that there was a sampling frame which may have been representative of the entire district. 
But when people went to an insecure area, they sampled the margins, the boundaries of those districts rather than the entire population. So you get completely opposite findings because you're looking at the more privileged, those people who have access and therefore you're not living necessarily across the entire geography. That's one of the reasons why, as we discussed in the break, it's so important to have geospatial coordinates and the data distribution patterns because then you can get a good measure of whether or not the data are representative. So my question in the long-winded way is, how do we ensure that routine information systems provide that information and its granularity? So uh, it's a, a, a very uh, timely question, Zulfi, because I think, you know, embedded in the SDG framework with its focus on leaving nobody behind and on, on inequalities is a major shift in what countries are being asked to report on, uh, which is, which addresses your quality assessment issue and also addresses, you know, the, a, a more proactive measurement of inequalities which is shifting from reporting at the national level to a, a very fine-grained level of reporting. And that, that's, the, uh, that's the way to go, because if you do know the um, spatial detail of where somebody's reporting, you can do all sorts of assessments, for example, about the, the sampling frame for surveys, especially as you know, satellite imagery on human settlements is getting better so that we have a much better sense of where populations are. Uh, and, and that's a trend that we're seeing in some countries, but I think we're also seeing the reverse trend right now. We're actually seeing a trend towards less data transparency, despite the SDG rhetoric around this. Uh, we're seeing in, in places like China much greater reluctance to share data uh, because of the sort of political pen pendulum against transparency. Mm -hmm. And that's also, you know, it's not a done deal. I think we've lived through 15 years of ever increasing transparency, so people are willing to share latitude and longitude of PSU levels for, you know, many surveys. Uh, the DHS has been helpful, MIX has been helpful, um, but we have a very long way to go uh, on that front. Take something as simple as administrative data on vaccination, where some countries are sharing, but lots don't want to. And so that is the direction the analysis should go. We have the tools to use that uh, at, at many levels, but you know, I think we need to all collectively uh, you know, advocate for that sort of data transparency down to that, that local level. Yeah, thanks, um, uh, uh, Zofia, great, a great question. Um, and I, I really do think that this is gonna be, um, it's, it's, it's actually one of the major challenges I see in terms of measurement and data is how, how will um, routine informa health information systems develop? Um, because the technology is way ahead of the thinking and the strategy here. So people are now able to collect data very simply from everybody from frontline workers to others. But there, there's very few places that have a really clear data strategy. It gets to what something that Chris said, you know, are, you know what are we measuring? Oh, you know, and, and what marker should we lay down with our data? Um, and then what is the process we, through which we analyze those data? So I really like the idea of moving more to an outcome focus, but then we have to define what are those outcomes are we looking at? mortality are we looking at effective coverage or are we looking so how far up there do we set down our markers and does that change based on you know the type of condition or the type of intervention so I think we need more clarity about what um, what that data structure looks like um, and what markers we put um, that we want to measure to track um, uh, inequalities to track progress uh, I think getting getting that right is going to be um, really important because if you think about it from the from a, a program manager's perspective, the first thing that they're asking from their system is to make sure that they're spending their money. This is the, the first accountability for a lot of program managers at a state level or even at a district level is are you dispersing money? So that's usually what they're trying to track is you've gotten this money, are you spending this money? Um, and so there there's a huge drive to that the last thing people want to report on is outcomes, right? That, so if you go to a, a health facility or a district, there's a lot of secrecy around reporting at a, at a granular level 
Um, you, you, Uttar Pradesh has not had a malaria, a rep, an officially reported malaria case in about 10 years um, through, the, through the HIS because there's, there's this expectation of a punitive kind of response to it. So people have been trained not to report on, on these kinds of things. Um, so what we're doing practically is we're, we're actually trying to, we've weaned completely the program off of external data systems and just working with the routine uh, systems and augmenting them. Because as long as you've got sort of a parallel system for measurement, the impetus for people to think about how to improve the routine system isn't really there. So trans transitioning all of what we've been measuring on a project basis to say, can we measure or get similar measures from the system? And what are the critical data uh, points that we need? Um, and what are the quality issues? Because there's a huge range of quality across the different types of data. So we're trying to analyze which data, what, are their what is the quality, so that you can have some predictability about you know, whether this is a, an indicator you can use from the system. But I think this is really an important frontier to, to start looking at is what data, how to collect it. But what is your, what is your data theory? Um, how, how are you going to think about the data and how you're going to use the indicators, especially when you've got such a complex um, rubric like the SDGs? Dr. Collins, I can only imagine if there are challenges around collecting data on malaria that the challenges around collecting data on mental health issues is even larger. Do you want to comment on that, please? Yeah, no, I was just thinking. I was thinking of two things as James was talking. There's a, a colleagues of mine are involved in a project where they're scaling up the use of community health workers to detect depression in the context of the HIV care platform in um, a couple of provinces in South Africa. And so what they've done is to introduce a screening instrument, obviously. Um, and then are really working with nurses at individual clinics on looking at this data and, and setting forth quality improvement <laughs> methods. So, you know, let's review the data. Let's see where the data do don't make sense. Then how do we do better next time? And, and, and what's part of what's happened there is an increasing transparency in those clinic settings where there's been trust built. People are actually proud now of what they've been able to achieve with identifying patients who have, who have a problem, um, and then being able to get people access to care. So I, so I, I think there are two things. It's, it's challenging to advocate to get uh, screening for depression, even something that's, I, I won't say it, I mean, it's, it's technically somewhat simple, but it's still not that simple. Um, it's challenging to advocate to get those things integrated, but once they are, and once people have the proper training and supervision around how to use them, how to do quality assurance checks, um, the screening linked with the care is reinforcing because number one, people see improvements in their patient population. Um, and I think that's also then a motivator to say, how do we do this better each time? But it's still a big question. I mean, the other, the other controversy with, uh, with data on mental illness is around Stigma. So people, some you know, I, you, Scandinavian countries may have registries, but that's something that you don't find in most countries because people are, aren't sure of data security, privacy, and the results of discrimination. Sophie, can you turn your microphone off, please? <laughs> and Dita. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for the great presentations. My question builds upon the discussion we're already having, and I'm curious to hear more about your reflections on how the challenges of data collection have changed over time since the GBD study started. And are the challenges different now? Are they mostly related to data quality as opposed to actually collecting some of the data as before? Uh, well, this will probably take both of us because Chris and I probably have complementary perspectives on this. I'm going to give a, a non-technical perspective. You asked about challenges um, to data collection. There is a lot more data out there on the key parameters that we measure in the global burden of disease than we have access to. Let me just repeat that. There's a lot more data out there that we have access to. The benefit of getting more data is that we would be able to reduce uncertainty around the estimates uh, for populations at all levels of the spectrum that I reported on this morning. Reduced uncertainty will greatly increase policy utility 
of the estimates of the burden of disease. So one of the things that we have tried very hard to do through collaborative agreements, and there are a vast number of them that we have with that collaborating network, is to increase the, the, deposit, the depositing of data into the burden of disease study, the critical appraisal of those data using the methods that we've developed over the years, in the, in the, in the context of confidence that we're not abusing the data. We're trying to make sure that data is used for what it's intended for, namely to inform, uh, develop evidence and inform policy. I, don't, I think that remains a key challenge for us. How can we, through our collaborations and our collaborative networks, increase the inflow of data and information and science, not just data, but science on, say, risk factors and some of the things Chris talked about on climate this morning? Um, how can we do better so that the GBD in five or ten years' time is far better informed by data that's available? It's not going out and collecting new data, but just think of the vast number of step surveys on NCDs that would be invaluable in increasing the, um, the, the accuracy of, of, or reducing uncertainty, let's say, around the burden of disease estimates. Or the vast number of DHS surveys um, that, uh, or other surveys for, for which having more micro data would, would increase the ability of the GBD to me be more useful. So that would be, to me, a, a non-technical answer, but a really important collaboration that we are, are yet to develop better. So just, just a, uh, an add-on, you know, I think in the years of uh, trying through our, our network of collaborators uh, to leverage the data that exists, it turns out the greatest barrier to that is academics. Uh, because governments, in the end, are really interested in helping their own people. And so with a little bit of persuasion, they usually understand the value of getting the contributing data. Academics are interested in promoting their own careers to a large extent. And so they hold, not all, there's, there's pockets of, 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 uh, of shining light there, but generally our experience is that the people who hold data the closest, who will hoard data for decades, uh, are academics. And so it's us collectively that uh, are often the impediment to, to uh, leveraging more of the existing data. And this just happens over and over and over again. The, uh, on the, the direction for new data, I think it's really about uh, taking advantage and strengthening the administrative data systems like civil registration with cause of death uh, that can be incredibly powerful when they're functioning well. And there are some great success stories. You know, China has gone from registering, you know, six, seven percent of deaths in the 90s to 80 percent uh, today in a, in a pretty short order, um, and they've demonstrated you can scale up those sort of systems. Uh, and there are, there are many other success stories. But I think it's that those administrative data, whether it's clinic or hospital, but largely uh, you know, event-based registration, uh, that there's tremendous potential to, Im to improve quality in a relatively short period of time. This question on the right. Hi, um, Ginny Kim from Public Health Ontario. So this question is for any of the panelists, but particularly for Drs. Lopez and Murray. I'm wondering if you can comment, based on your ob observations of policy uh, decisions that have been made through um, the evidence you've created, you've generated, um, whether there's been um, you know, decisions with respect to the strength of evidence. Because you know, many of you spoke today about um, efforts to understand the quality of data, um, to understand the strength of evidence behind um, you know, certain disease uh, risk factor outcome pairings. But when it comes to decisions that are made, do policymakers actually distinguish between um, the different levels of evidence? Is it really just an academic exercise, or, or have you seen that decision makers are actually interested in those? It's a great question, and I think actually each of the panelists can have a chance to answer it. Does it make a difference to the policymakers? I'll go first. Uh, policymakers are not interested in uncertainty. You know, I've never seen anybody interested in uncertainty. The, their technical advisors are, so I think at some level it does uh, work its way into uh, their, their mind space, but they'd rather see graphs without uncertainty intervals. 
Having said that, the one area where you do get a lot of discussion, not about uncertainty in a formal sense, but about strength of evidence, is on risk outcome relationships. So they're not really interested in uncertainty about the prevalence of ischemic heart disease. They'll, they're going to take as given the technical communities giving them the information. But since everybody has their own strong opinion about diet and health, because you know whatever they they happen to believe they think is true, uh, you know you find that you get into a vigorous argument with policymakers about the strength of evidence about fruit and vegetables and salt and and diet particularly exercise. So some of the the behavioral risks. Uh, you do get this sort of strength of evidence dialogue, and that seems very important. So that part of the GBD around risk outcome relationships and the strength of evidence, I actually think will matter. I think that if you say this is a five-star relationship versus a one-star relationship, that'll actually fit with some of the media debates about you know, what do we really know about diet and, and outcome, as an example. Uh, just Oh, sorry. No, Pamela, okay. No. So I think that's a really great question, and it's one that um, I think everyone struggles with. <laughs> what you know? What does the policymaker really want to know? Um, we assume because we we put a lot of effort into trying to generate data on effectiveness, and, spe and specifically on cost effectiveness. So we assume that people need to understand what the threat is in their particular context. That they need to know that there is a solution, and 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 it helps when that data for that solution has also been delivered in that particular context as well. Um, and so that's why there's been so much effort, in the, certainly in the mental health world, to say, look, these disorders are prevalent. Here are some basic interventions that one can do in a health system or in a community for things like depression, for psychosis, for anxiety. But I think then when you look and see what countries have actually scaled up mental health services or where has there been that commitment, I don't know that that's driven necessarily by these same kinds of factors that we are, that we believe are important. So I think they're important. I agree with what you're saying, that people like certainty. They like to, they like something concrete to, to know that they can do. Um, but, but ultimately, what gets something high on a priority or as a high priority on the agenda, um, it's, that's certainly not sufficient. <laughs> I think um, that's a that's a really good question. I think um, my observation over the last say 15, 20 years is that there's really been a transformation in the whole process of uh, bringing evidence, uh, particularly to policymakers in in the in uh, lower and middle income countries. I think the we're, what I see as a shift or a, a, a change is from this idea that global guidance is going to come down from global normative bodies. Um, you know, the WHO will come out with a guideline and evidence and those kinds of things. Um, and, and countries sort of passively accepting that and try to deliver it. And then they'll need a few consultants to help them implement it, those kinds of things. So that kind of a, a model. Now what I'm seeing is a lot, a lot of times governments and, and health program leaders are um, avidly looking out for the evidence. They, they, they want to solve problems. So they, they define a problem that they have, and they're looking for people who will have the evidence. So it's a very, it's a very different process and much more successful if it's somebody in a, in a policy role asking the question. Uh, they're much more receptive to receiving the, 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 the evidence and being guided by the evidence, rather than a push phenomenon, which is, Look, uh, you know, I've I've done this study. I think you should implement this. That that to me, I don't think will ever be effective. It's never really been that effective in my experience. But I'm seeing more and more pull of a pull phenomenon now, where where governments are trying to problem solve and then they're receptive to the to the evidence. The question then becomes the cacophony of evidence that gets presented to them. But that's another issue. Alan, comments? Yeah, just building on James. It's a nice segue into uh, in that question. Um, uh, we're seeing exactly the same thing. I think hoping that WHO guidelines will then influence countries to improve the quality or availability of data or relevance of data systems is a dream. It, it just doesn't happen. But what does happen in countries is that when we go in and talk to them about burden of disease and how to improve the utility of burden of disease by using more data and having uh, improving the quality of administrative data systems that Chris talked about, they respond to that. They absolutely understand they just need some help 
about what exactly is it that we can do uh, that can yield better quality data in a short frame of, of time. And around, say, causes of death, for part of my nighttime job is I lead a large initiative for the Bloomberg Foundation on improving the quality of causes of death in 20 countries. And every single one of those countries gets it and understands that better quality cause of death data is critical and that there are relatively simple ways to do that. So they are getting quite sophisticated, as, as James says, in their expectation of the technical assistance they need to turn around these systems. Nadia, on this question, you have the last word. Okay. Um, so I think I agree with all the other panelists, um, so I don't have much more to add, but I, I will speak from my experience in Afghanistan and having worked so closely with policymakers on the ground, and I agree with Chris in that um, policymakers and people in government, they don't care about the uncertainty. They want an answer. And if I can deliver a clear message to them that, hey, this is what your data looks like, um, they'll believe it as long as I'm confident. The tricky part is that I may not be confident because there's a level of uncertainty around what I'm saying. Um, and so that navigating that becomes quite challenging because then the dialogue becomes, are you sure? Are you confident? Or are you not confident? So um, for policymakers, I think I would just agree that having really clear messages and clear data and something that is actionable for them is really important and that's something they can take and, and use to influence policy or, or, or programming in their countries. Um, and another, I think, challenge in that, that area um, is, is the one about data between what the country uses as their administrative estimates or going estimates for certain health outcomes um, or process indicators versus what we find in our modeled data or our, our further um, you know, subnational analyses that we do. So that ends up becoming quite a, a bit of a challenge sometimes um, if you know, we come up with something different or the modeled mortality estimates say something different and the country is using their own DHS estimates. So I think having that conversation and really being able to speak in a lay way to policymakers to explain why there's a discrepancy and why they should consider our estimates versus theirs or vice versa. Um, having those clear and open conversations is really important to influencing policy. Yeah. Dr. Collins. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more comment to this, to the question of where's the push and where's the pull coming from. One, one of the things that we've seen in the global mental health research community over the last few years is really, um, a collaboration with governments, right? And a collaboration with policymakers. And that's partly been because funders have required it. But that when you go to people at the start of your study and say, I want to make sure that I'm asking questions that will actually be of use to you, then you're much more likely to get buy in in the end. You know, hopefully you'll have some results that can be useful. But establishing that relationship and not going, not expecting your paper to somehow get to them and to somehow influence policy later, I think is quite important. We have, we have time for three more questions. There are three lights that are on. We'll start on the right, please. Could I ask you to make these short questions and fairly short answers? Um, sure, okay. Um, my first question was to do with uh, the quality of data. I think that's had a fairly good airing. Maybe I'll just point out, I know the WHO's extended program on immunization has recently, recently completely rewritten its manual for doing surveys to estimate coverage levels. Um, second question is to do with life expectancy. Um, I understand the UK, they've recently seen for the first time in decades a, a drop in life expectancy. And I think in the US, I think white males, there's some concerns about uh, whether uh, they're, they're having similar, uh, showing similar patterns. Um, and there's even concern now in Canada especially in BC, that the opioid crisis is potentially leading to a drop in life expectancy. So where do you see this going? Um, I, I mean, it's hard. I assume that something like uh, opioid crisis could not have been seen, say, 10 years ago. Um, and is it the sort of thing that will blow over in a shortish time? Or is it something you think will extend for a period? Uh, thanks. So in April, we published uh, the PBD collaboration published in JAMA, our US burden by state analysis. And so, uh, I, and I pick on that because it gets to your exact question about what's happening in the US. And what was very interesting in the United States is that below age 20 in all 50 states over the last 25 years, there's been steady 
progress. Differential rates of progress, but progress nevertheless. In all 50 states in the United States over age 55, there has been steady progress in terms of uh, age-specific mortality. Every single age group in all 50 states over 55 going down. Between the ages of 20 and 55, and we have these sort of uh, not brightly colored diagrams there that show this, uh, we had essentially the US diverging into two groups. And I, I'll get the exact number wrong, uh, but about 13 states, there has been rising all-cause mortality between ages 20 and 55. That rise started in 1998 and has been continuous and linear since 1998. So while there's a lot of attention right now uh, of the recent time period, it's not a new phenomenon. It's been going for 20 years. And if you drill in by cause, uh, it is essentially a small set of causes. It is um, uh, uh, opioid deaths, suicide, cirrhosis, and diabetes. And what's happening is that the engine of progress in life expectancy has been the decline in cardiovascular disease, largely, somewhat cancer and somewhat chronic re respiratory disease. And in the states, uh, and, and those increases in those four causes are actually happening more generally, but what happens in the states where all causes are getting worse is that increase is larger. You know, think West Virginia, think you know, Eastern Kentucky, uh, think New Mexico. And the decline in cardiovascular disease is also slowing down. Uh, and in the states where mortality has gotten worse, essentially in some places it's sort of flat, and then you have these four causes going up. We're seeing those same four causes going up in a number of countries in Western Europe. So it's not just the UK. So this is a more general phenomenon around those. And, uh, but it's not everywhere. You know, in places like California, there's, this, this, this is not happening. You know, the, the general de decline continues. Uh, if you look in our forecast models, of course, the forecast models see a 20-year rise in opioid deaths. It's not, it's really linear, you know, 20 years increase, and we'll run them into the future as well. Now, will that happen? Will there be a, a concerted social response? We would hope, but just by trends, uh, the, the basic drivers behind this, which is the slowdown of progress in cardiovascular disease, you know, obesity, a big important factor behind that, will, will continue, we expect, in the future. And then it's really hard to know about these deaths of despair, you know, the label that people have given to that combination of alcohol, suicide, and drug-related deaths. So, yeah. Well, I think the time has actually come when uh, our lunch is being served in a moment or two. I'd like to, uh, First of all, thank the audience for your participation and your great questions. Thank the panel for um, clearly putting, having put in a huge amount of work to uh, prepare the comments and to respond to the questions. I'm a pretty simple guy in terms of my understanding of what went on this morning, but basically, if we say that there is a need for evidence to influence policy, and we need policy to improve the health of, in this case, since we're at sick, it's the children and the mothers, that uh, evidence poly cha policy change and improved health all go together. What we've seen this morning, and I guess what I'd like to do is certainly thank Dr. Lopez and Dr. Murray and congratulate you for your huge long-term contribution to this whole concept of evidence. How deserving you are of the 2018 John Dirks Canada Gairdner Award. So thank you for being here with us this morning and thank you for your contribution. And again, I'd just like to remind the audience that um, we were supported by the Dalana School of Public Health, Grand Challenges Canada, and the Gairdner Foundation for this morning. And I'd like to invite everyone to have lunch with us where we had our coffee break uh, two hours ago. Again, thank you very much.